Hey guys, this is Josh and Carolyn with Homesteading Family and welcome to this week's episode of the Pantry Chat Food for Thought. This week we're talking about how we raise all of our own meat, or most of our own meat, and how you can too. For a year's worth. A yep. year's worth of meat, yeah. Absolutely. With prices raising at the grocery store on meat, oh, it's getting it's, expensive. It is getting expensive. And honestly, I have not, we've been raising our own meat for so long, I'm not extremely in touch with what, you know, meat prices are and where they've gone. But I know in talking to a lot of people, yeah. things are getting rough. And there's actually a lot you can do in a small space. We're going to talk about everything we do here and then give you guys a little bit of strategy on how to approach it if you're new to this or you're struggling, some just tips and tricks that'll help you um, depending on where you're at and your scale. But first, the chit chat. Can't chit -chat. miss the chit chat. We haven't been able to get to chit chat a whole lot this I know. summer. Uh, I'm yeah. missing you. Yeah, <laughs> you but, too. But having some fun conversations too with other folks. <laughs> Yeah, that's been fun. You've been out and traveling and working with some other people. So yeah. I guess that kicks off the uh, what have you been doing. But first, if you're new to the pantry chat, we do chit chat for a few minutes to get started. Um, if you want to skip the chit chat and go right to the main topic, that is time stamped for you. Absolutely. Good. So yeah. where have you been and what have you been doing? Wow. <laughs> well, I've, most of you or a lot of you probably saw if you didn't go check it out after you watch this. But um, I was with Paul Gauchi all last week in Washington. Um, if you're not familiar with him, that is Back to Eden Garden. Most people, if you're in the homesteading life or gardening, you know about Back to Eden Method, and that comes from Paul Gauchi. And uh, we're actually filming a class with him where he's teaching his method. I don't think he's ever quite done it this way before. It's really exciting where we're actually laying it out and getting into the details, and this is gonna be a class for the School of Traditional Skills. Yeah. Keep your ears open for that, for the announcement, all that. August 1st, right? I think is when There's we're going to big, big announcement, announcement coming we'll, we'll on keep, August 1st. Keep giving you a little inside here, but um, but that's really exciting to get to hang out with him for a week. Super, super neat guy. Yeah. Just, just an amazing guy. He loves the Lord and and um, and just fascinating, his, his view on things. And a lot of things that I've studied and that I know a lot mm -hmm. of people in my circles have studied and, you know, researched. He's come to through really just honest observation and talking to God and, and trying things amazing. in his garden. And uh, it's really, really neat. So, so yeah, and if you, did, if you missed that pantry chat, that was a good interview. And um, man, the week before <laughs> that, <laughs> I was in Oklahoma with Brandon Sheard. If you guys are familiar with him, the Farmstead Meatsmith. Of course, you know I love my ball caps. Um, and, and yes, he does still have hair under there. So I, I do. It's here. <laughs> I've, I've heard it's disappearing in the back, so I'll just keep my hat on. <laughs> That's such an easy it's solution a for a guy. Like, you know, that would not be the answer for a female. We, we don't see a lot of your panicking. girls going bald. I, thankfully, you know, thankfully. I, yeah, yeah. I, I agree. We'll take it. You, know, you keep your hair. <laughs> okay, sounds good. Uh, so uh, anyways, yeah, and uh, I think that pantry chat's out as well, where I got to interview Brandon, and um, yeah, we were curing pork, salt curing pork the traditional way, and we've done a bit of that, and we've gotten busy and gotten away from it, and I was re-inspired to come back and look at, you know, curing whole pieces of the animal, curing your own, it's so easy, you guys, it is so, so simple, and you know, it's scary, because it's like, can I really do this? And I remember when we first yep. did it some seven years ago or so, and we just looked at it hanging up there in the pantry. Like, and I was like, can we eat that? Is, is it that really safe? that easy? <laughs> and it is, and it's safe. And Brandon took us all through that and, and, and much, much more and very, very cool. So that's that's been my last two weeks. And um, That's really exciting. And back here, just working on the homestead and trying to keep projects going here. And so for those of you guys who don't know, Josh kind of talked about the School of Traditional Skills. That is a new project that we're working on. It platform. is a brand new platform that will be coming out. Again, you'll get the announcements on that on August 1st. So yeah. you guys are kind of getting the insight because you're here with us as it's happening. But it's really, really exciting. I'm so excited about it. And I love you're talking about Brandon Sheard, Farmstead Meatsmith and how simple some of these old traditional skills really are. He says that the hardest part of curing pork is believing that it's actually that simple. Yeah. And I think that's so true because we're like, oh, it's gotta be more complicated than this. And it, so many of these old skills really aren't. They're not well, that complicated. We want to complicate them in our modern, like it's gotta have more steps. It's gotta have more this or more that. And it just, it's not well, that Well, it's not even that we want to. We've been taught that it's complicated because some professional has got to do it in a factory somewhere. 
Um, and you know what, for mass delivery and mass maintenance of all that, yeah, there's a lot of safety issues and so things have to get done, but this is not the way the world's worked for six, eight, ten thousand years. You know, uh, people have dealt with all this, fed themselves, mm -hmm. and so this is definitely what, you know, what our life is about in the School of Traditional Skills is learning how to do the things, still in the modern life, because right. we still got to live our modern life. But so much of this and just, you know, being with Paul and Brandon, that was the theme in both of them. It's like, this, this is really simple. It's believing that you can do it yeah. and getting your head out of, you know, all the fear and all the things that say we need to be dependent on the professionals and the grocery stores to do some of these things when we don't. And the reality is like prosciutto and ham in the store is not prosciutto and ham. It's, it's something else. <laughs> <laughs> some industrial... Yeah. Product. So anyways, it's really yeah. cool because a lot of it is simple. It's just learning the key steps. So there is learning to do, which is what School of Traditional Skills is all about, is mm -hmm. the journey of just learning, getting you right in there and showing you how to do it and get you engaged. Because yeah. it's just basic things that you need to do and then just having the confidence to do it and trust that uh, this works and our forefathers and grandmothers before us <laughs> did it generation after generation, a lot of these things. Pretty exciting. Yeah. yeah. So, anyways, I'm I've been out, not here a lot, and um, you've been here holding down yes. the fort. Yes. And uh, so, what about you? What is going on with you? Well, I don't know how it is in your households, but the moment Josh walks out the door, we kind of have this history of things <laughs> falling apart. And this, we we did pretty well for a while we there. A couple of years where, it, but yeah. you've been taking a child with you on each of these filming trips. Yeah, some of the which older kids. Get really them, exciting. You know, yeah. And I did not know how much I have come to depend on our oldest son when you were gone. And so there was a moment where you and Tristan both left yeah. and they weren't even to the airport and I was making emergency vet calls. The oven broke, the septic's backing up. Like it was one of those moments <laughs> where it was like, oh my goodness, how can I handle all of this? Um, and we're okay. We're still you surviving. Survived. You did well. We're, you know, the oven hasn't been replaced yet. It is broke, broke, And broken. we actually try to fix those things. Yes. And this one's actually Yeah, we've old replaced parts that, and yeah. run into the parts we can't replace now. Yep. And so, anyways. We, we bite that bullet. <laughs> we are getting through. We're, we're surviving that. But, um, but, yeah, you know, it's been, uh, because it's been such a late spring here, now that it's warmed up and we feel like we are truly past the freezes and the frosts, um, uh, now it's like, go. You well, know, it's fast all of a sudden. So I've been trying to yeah. manage fast all of a sudden. So that's me. That's what I've been doing. We're getting eight gallons of milk a day in from the milk cow, which means we have to make a huge batch of cheese almost every day, or we should be if, if we were using it all. Trying to be, yeah, good steward. So at this point, we have a lot of neighbors who are getting really good milk because I can't make a whole batch of cheese every single day right well, now. And we've got, we've got, you've got an intern here we have, helping yes. and her and Rachel are actually working the cheese program. Yep. So we've got uh, Parmesan happening right now yeah. and cheddar yesterday. And so we're really, you know, building up our cheese cave for the year right yeah. now, which is exciting. It dwindled down. I'm looking at it right over here. There are three cheeses left from last year. And so that'll be about perfect to get these cheeses yeah. aged enough to, you know, be able to eat. So that's exciting, always. Eggs are coming in at an alarming rate. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to keep the freeze dryer running and buckets of limed eggs and freezers getting filled up. And that's great that, you know, also the garden had to go in. Well, I was going to say, I got home on a Friday mm -hmm. and we had a major group effort. We had our main crop planting. Now, we're always trying to stage out, you know, our planting. I think this year it's not as much, we're not doing as much succession planting as we right. often do with everything going on. But we hit our main crop and, and all pitched in together. And that was actually a really cool day. We got that done and, and it wasn't even a full day and got, got the garden in. Yes. That's yeah. very good. Yeah. Well, we have been, I've got to say, we have been doing succession planting for the greens. It's just that the geese found oh. the green bed. And so, 
you can't tell we've been doing succession planting because it's all kind of oh, the same. they mowed the Chinese cabbage, didn't <laughs> they? They did. Yeah. They took out my yeah. kimchi cabbage. Yeah, no. I'm not happy. Which fencing just went in. That's the other yes. thing, which we've not, we've had some help with the fencing, but we've been getting that in so that we can actually keep some pastured chickens and geese and yeah. smaller animals away from the terraces and kitchen gardens and <laughs> everything else. So not yeah. quite fast enough on that fence. Right. <laughs> hey, before we jump into the question of the day, I've got to show you guys the brand new issue of the In the Homestead Kitchen magazine is just out right. this month. It's on strawberries. Make sure you follow the link and go get your subscription because we have one coming out every single month. Now, I want to be really clear. This is the only physical copy in existence. You will not get a physical copy. It is a digital magazine. Aww. I know. One day I dream of being Me able too. to actually turn this into a physical magazine that you guys get in the mail. But for the moment, it's digital. And this month it's on strawberries. We talk about how to grow strawberries, how to harvest them. We have a lot of great recipes. Um, you guys are always asking me for more of my recipes. And so this is where we're putting them. Is in, into this, here, in the into magazine, the magazine. right? Yeah. Um, strawberry mousse. And this is like homemade, delicious stuff. This is solid ingredients, easy ingredients that you can source anywhere. Um, good, homemade, family friendly. These are not fancy recipes that you're you know, only going to find ingredients for by ordering things. And, and I can attest to it. I'm the resident taste tester. <laughs> Sometimes um, I call it the guinea pig. We also got to work with Heidi Horth um, and she gave us one of her kid recipes oh, on cool. strawberries. So that's really exciting wow, because it's a visual recipe so you can help your young children even start to, um, to cook. But we talk all about preserving strawberries, how to freeze them, how to freeze dry them, how to turn them into great jams and fruit leathers. So make sure you jump over and grab your copy while it's still available. It's only available this month. You got to get it and then you can download it and then it's yours. And then after that, it goes away to make room for the next issue. So it's printable, so, right? Downloadable, it is printable. printable. So you it is can printable. make your own physical copy yeah, to and take into the kitchen and work with or whatever. Beautifully viewable on a tablet or a phone or something like that too, yeah. if you want to just keep it there because it is a lot of color. So, yeah. um, so for printing, it might be a little hard, but yeah. So jump over and grab that. But today we have a question of the day. I, I got this one. It's, yep. your, it's for you. So okay. little cougar on the brownie mix video. On your dry mixes, do you vacuum seal the jars or just screw on the lids and put it on the shelf as is? Personally, I just screw on the lids and put it on the shelf as is. We go through those pretty quickly. We'll go through them within about three months. If you wanted them to sit for a really long time on your pantry shelf, it, you know, vacuum sealing is never a bad idea. It um, just, you know, helps to decrease any flavor loss really is what mm -hmm. you're dealing with in something like a brownie mix. You know, you don't want that cocoa to not taste so coke, excuse me, cocoa-ish anymore. Um, that's really what you're dealing with. None of the ingredients in there is technically going to go bad. So you do extend your shelf life though. But if you guys haven't tried that, they are phenomenal. They are so incredibly good. Oh, yeah. One thing I did learn though, after putting that particular video out is that because we've had our convection oven, my times in my recipes are often off. No. Because convection ovens cook a lot faster. So a lot of people were telling me, while I said about 25 to 30 minutes, theirs was taking closer to 45 minutes to bake. So something to be aware of, something for me to be aware of, but also you guys, if you go to try it, you might expect it to take a little longer than I said in the recipe. Good to know. So, yeah, there you go. Right on. Okay. So. Jumping into topic, how to raise, how we raise, and but we're going to also share with you how you can raise a year's worth of meat. Yes. In our household, that is a lot of meat. So always keep in mind when we're talking about quantities of food that we have a large family and we tend to have a lot of guests mm. around. So we've got 10 children. We have at the moment, one intern and a family friend staying with us mm -hmm. for so a while. 14 in-house eating every day. Yeah, and then obviously you and I. And then grandma and grandpa are here on the property, so they're stopping in for meals regularly. Mm -hmm. And then we'll have like my brother and his daughter are going to come and stay for about three weeks. So they'll be around. So we have a lot of people we're feeding. 
I say that to you so you don't start hyperventilating when you hear the number of animals we raise right. <laughs> for me. You don't have to do that. So we'll, we'll get to some strategy, how you can figure out what you need for a year's worth of meat in a minute after we just talk about what, you know, what, right. what we're doing, what that looks like here on a large, you know, family homestead. Um, but we will break it down because it, it's a little, it's a little crazy, sounds like. So, I mean, let's just dive in. We're raising... Um, anywhere from 150 to 200 meat chickens every year. Yes, this so. year we are raising 200, but 50 of them are for our son is selling them. Right. Yep. So 150 for our family. Right, and that's that is uh, 150. That is 750 to 900 pounds right there yeah. of meat. And um, for us, we're just getting started. <laughs> that's a lot of meat right yeah, there, right is, there alone. Yeah. Um, we also are raising a couple turkeys for us as we're talking about yeah, poultry. Yeah, turkeys. We usually do about three poultry, three turkeys that we keep for the household. Mm -hmm. We raise more and sell them. And, um, but well, I'm not getting this to a minute because we didn't even really talk about it beforehand. But turkeys, because they get so large, they they can be a good. Everything's chickens, but turkeys can be a good way to raise quite a bit of meat in one animal. Mm -hmm. And so there's some benefits to that if you don't mind like canning it, breaking it down a little bit, and not just putting it up whole. But so we do a few turkeys. We also do a few geese. We mm -hmm. have a free ranging pair on the on the farm. Yep. And so we get a few geese in, um, and then we raise pigs. And we've, we've usually two pigs. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And we've gone to more of a, a lard type pig. Yeah. And so we, this year we're raising Cooney Cooney. Some of you guys have followed us on the journey that we yeah. have now our breeding pair of Cooney Coonies, and we're waiting for them to breed because apparently. They're a little fat and lazy, just to be <laughs> honest and candid. Um, and that's probably my fault. They they came in. They came from a friend's in California in warmer weather, and they came in in the fall. So I was, I was worried about them going into winter. It's more humid here, colder. And so I wanted to make sure they were beefed up. Now, now these, these <laughs> Beef, heritage beefed breeds... Beefed up is a understatement. <laughs> These heritage breeds, and especially the cunies, the fat pigs, um, they they fatten real easily. Well, okay, let, let's differentiate that. They are fat pigs. They're very fat okay, right Okay, so now. they're a lard pig. But they're a lard pig, which producing means more lard. they're going to naturally put on more fat so that you can produce more lard right. once they get to your kitchen. Which is what we want. That's that's a goal for our, us, yeah. not just the meat, but the lard. And that's a whole other discussion about lard and butter and cooking fats and yeah, and um, it's a little easier to get some of that from pigs. Yes. Anyways, um, you know, I wanted them to do well through the winter. And so we fed them pretty well, I guess, better than I thought, because it wasn't that excessive of feeding. Anyways, they got fat. They stayed warm. and um, But now they're not breeding because they're, they're a little fat and lazy. So they, <laughs> thankfully, coonies graze. They're good yes. grazers. So we've now gotten them out to pasture, mm -hmm. and we're having to... Shoe them along a little bit and then push they, them. But they have an exercise program. Right. So they've got an exercise <laughs> program and they're eating more greens than grains, which is great. They actually will fatten very well on grass. Well, and I've got to say, it is testament to the fact that you can raise pigs well off of kitchen scraps, just like they oh, used to do. Yeah. Like we're having to not give them our kitchen scraps now, not as much of them well, because they were over fattening on kitchen scraps. We actually pulled all the grain by March, late March, yeah. in just kitchen scraps, and then they still weren't losing weight yeah. on just the kitchen scraps. So I was finally like, okay, it's grass is getting up, let's get them out, and we're now pulling the kitchen scraps back. So you want to talk <laughs> about economical meat raising. Yeah. You yeah. know, that's a good way to go. Okay, yep. so we have so a couple of pigs. We got a couple of pigs, and then a couple of sheep. We raise yeah. two to four sheep every year, depending on the year, and we're, we restarted a flock. And because uh, we switch breeds, and so we're probably just gonna have two this year, which mm -hmm. is which is kind of our standard. Yep, and usually a beef, a yes. full beef. Yep, and which is gonna yield us four to five hundred pounds of meat. Mm -hmm. And um, and then usually we fill in the gaps with a bit of hunting, some venison, yeah. and a little bit of fishing for us up here. We don't get a chance to fish real seriously, but we also do supplement with some. You have found some great um, kind of like family-based fisheries, commercial right. fisheries, but they're selling prepackaged some salmon and and things that we enjoy. Yeah, and so um, that's rounding out the diet as well. Yeah, so we actually just found a, a new uh, company that it's a local cu couple who goes up and they fish on salmon season up in Alaska, mm -hmm. and they flash freeze everything right there on the boat, and then they bring it down, and you can buy it right here. So it's yeah. actually a local couple even though we don't have awesome salmon fishing right here. Yeah. Um, but, you know, 
that's not that's a nice addition to the diet to kind of mix it up a little bit so you can see that is a lot of meat for one and, family and it, that is you we're approaching two thousand pounds of cut in the freezer meat for yeah. us and i'll work in numbers with you in a, in a second we'll work in numbers and figure it out actually i haven't done our numbers exactly in a while we yeah. just kind of know what we need and we're in a range and we're generally doing it but there's a method and so that's that's definitely a lot to get you know off the hoof and into the freezer. The good news is, is you probably don't need to raise yeah. that much meat. <laughs> Definitely not. And we though are, we're fairly heavy meat eaters. We're, we're pretty solid. And so, you know, every family is going to be different. Mm -hmm. So let's just dive into like, how do you figure out how much you need for a year? And it's actually pretty simple. You kind of just got to figure out what's your average consumption per person per day. Right. And, you know, for us, we figure about a half pound per person, which is, I would say, on the heavy side. Yeah. Um, but that kind of covers our guests, our coming and going. You know, I think a quarter to a third is probably more realistic, but mm -hmm. it's going to depend on your eating style, your diet. It might be less for some, it might be more for others. Yeah. Um, but that's the first thing is in, in, if you're buying meat from the store, just look at what you're buying and how you're consuming it. You know, and if you haven't really thought about it that way, and just look for a number, and you got to just start out estimating. But mm -hmm. but if you're you're buying food or you're cooking meals regularly, with whole foods, you should be able to come up with a number and say, okay, our family eats a quarter pound per person a day, and we'll go with four people, so that's a pound a day mm -hmm. per you know for for the family times 365. That's 365 pounds for the year that you would need. So that, that math is really easy to get yourself a target yeah. in how much meat do you need to raise or bring in. Yeah, and I think that's so good to have an actual quantifiable number oh, like very that. Helpful. It's yeah. really, really helpful. Not only does it help you understand what you're spending on meat, say at the grocery store, um, <clears throat> it helps to give you those targets. Now, one of the things that here in the modern world, we are really used to, I know this has been a real struggle for me different years as we've been trying to figure out mm -hmm. our meat problem or project and growing our meat, um, is diversity. We're used to, you know, yeah, you can go, if you need 365 pounds of meat, you can go get one beef from a local rancher, have it butchered, and you can have beef every single day of the year for your entire mm -hmm. allotment. Um, you know, that's not how we're used to eating no, in our culture. No. And so for me, we've had years where all we could do was raise chickens or all we could do was raise, you know, sheep or you know, as we've gotten started for different reasons. And that's been a real challenge. So make sure as you're thinking about this, that you add in the diversity factor to it too. You don't just want 400 pounds of beef and that's your meat for the year, if you have a choice. Now, if you get into a situation where that's all you can do, then that's all you can mm -hmm. do and you live with it and you figure it sure. out right and it is doable and i was gonna i'll talk about that in chickens in a minute because that's one of the easiest places to start yeah. with small space and low commitment over mm -hmm. time but um you know you do want to add like you said 400 because 365 but you're probably going to have guests yeah um you're also going to have bone in so really when we're talking about that quarter pound or say third pound which is probably a closer daily average um, that's without the bone. So, so you do need to round up a certain mm -hmm. percentage and, you know, like the 365, I'd just take it to, to 400. That's about 10%, you know, yeah. increase. Um, in, but you got to figure that if you're, if you, if you are, do a lot of hospitality, if you feed a lot of people, then you need to increase that even more. And really after you do that for a year or two, using that method, you'll just start to get a feel and you'll start to know, yeah. you know, okay, we need to, we need to get an extra feeder lamb this year, you know, yeah. or we need to, you know, buy a larger beef if we're buying in or, or, you know, supplement because our beef is smaller or something like that. You, you start to figure that out and work it out, but those right. numbers really help you get going. Yeah. Okay, so let's dive into the different types of meat that we can raise or that yep. can be raised and kind of make some notes on that. First on our list is chickens. Yeah. Right? They're, they're really the gateway because they're easy to raise in a small space. You, you, you know, you, you prefer, preferentially you have some grass, but that's not required. Um, you definitely need some space, but not a ton of space. And the commitment's, you know, 8 to 12 weeks. Yeah. Um, and, and you can raise, I mean, you can easily raise, you know, say, uh, 400 pounds, that's, you know, 60 to 70 birds. Mm -hmm. 
and you can do that in you know one to two chicken tractors depending on the size yeah. and not a lot of space so it's a it's a very doable project mm -hmm. for a lot of people i love that time commitment is so much shorter because mm -hmm. it's not like you're getting into oh i'm gonna have a cow out in the barn for the next year and a half you know sort of a thing where you you feel like you're really committed to this it's a short period of time where you're committed and you can fill up your freezers that way one thing to really note about chicken though is that you know, your average chicken that you're going to raise is five to six pounds, probably. A lot of times, yeah. But five to six pounds include is the whole bird, which means mm. which means the bones. Well, the bones. It's got yeah, the bones not, in yeah, there. So if the you're opal. used to going to the grocery store and buying boneless, skinless chicken breasts, and you're replacing that yep. with a whole chicken, you do need to kind of finagle the math a little bit because that that is a difference if you're depending on that for your family meat supply. Definitely is. The 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 other side of that discussion is, and you should be doing this whether you got store bought or not, is making use of those bones and yeah. the skin and things that sometimes you may not eat. Hopefully you eat the skin, it's really good and it's good for you. But you can then make good broths mm -hmm. that turn into soups and lots of other stuff. So the other part of raising chickens is that it is actually a little challenging and fairly expensive to have somebody else butcher your chickens for you. It doesn't end up always working out great math-wise on the dollars. It's definitely going to save you a lot of money if you're set up to butcher yourself. So that is something that you do want to be aware of. It could be almost impossible to find somebody else to even pay to do your chickens. Mm. So you do need to be aware of that when you go into a chicken raising project. Yeah, you definitely do. And there's there's a little investment in equipment. Yeah. So, But that, that does pay for itself over time. You just want to get the equipment that's appropriate for the scale that you're at. Like we just made do. I mean, we had some old barrel for a lot of years and... We begged, borrowed, rented a chicken plucker, and we just dunked, you know, by hand. And, and we got by for a long time until we got up to well over 100 consistently every year. And we're like, okay, now it's time to go ahead and invest in a little more, you know, near professional style equipment. Yeah. And other people come and help out. And that's another thing to do is to make sure and, you know, bring people in and do it together. And you can pay people in chickens, and, and that helps get it done. But chickens are great because you can easily raise a year's worth of meat. Mm -hmm. On a small space, and I was reading a number not too long ago, because we're going to, you know, Justin Rhodes is kind of the guy that's really like dove into all the details of this, yeah. and, and we're going to be doing a class with him, which is really cool. But I thought I saw a number of about like 3,700 square feet. I'm not sure that I have that exactly right for 100 chickens. That's not very much land yeah. to grow. I mean, 100 chickens at five, that's 500 pounds of meat. So it's a pretty small space. So it's really easy to get into. It's easy to learn, to, to butcher, to get familiar with and get everybody involved with. So that's a great gateway and it's a great just, um, once you get the equipment, great you know economical way to raise really quality meat in a small space. Now, if space is your number one challenge that you have, the way to go to start with raising your own meat is actually not chickens, it's rabbits. Mm -hmm. Rabbits are another great place to start uh, with raising meat and the Number one benefit behind the rabbits is that they're reproducing and they're reproducing, giving you meat regularly. Right. So instead of one big flush all at the same time of meat, you kind of have this trickle in of meat that's going to go to your freezer. Yeah. And you can, you know, you can learn how to, to manage them similar in tractors, you know, mm -hmm. out on the grass. And um, there's a bit more to it. There, there is some more to managing rabbits. We're not experts in that at all. Mm -hmm. We've done you know, thousands of chickens, but... Um, not rabbits, and um, Daniel Salatin's really the guy to, to check to out on that. that. Yeah, but that that's a great small space mm -hmm. that you can do, and yeah. even smaller than chickens, really. Um, but I don't know the poundages and, no. <laughs> and some of that, so you'd have to do your research. But it is a good entryway. Yeah. yeah. Next, you start going up in size, and I, I really think a pig is the next best you know, moving up to a larger animal, that's the next best step yeah. because pigs are pretty easy to raise. Um, it's great if you can pasture them, but you don't have to. You just need to have adequate space for them to move around in and good housing and all those things. Yeah, if you eat pork, it uh, raising pigs is uh, so helpful because not only do you get the meat, but like we kind of touched on a few minutes ago, you get the lard from it. Mm -hmm. And that starts replacing then not only your meat, but also your, you know, the fat that you need. You can replace butter, you can replace oils, you can replace a lot of those things. So it starts uh, filling multiple purposes, I guess, in the food world on your homestead. Yeah. Um, and so that can be really, really beneficial. Another thing, 
um, is the curing. That yeah. it, it's very curable. So pork is very storable as a meat. It's very storable. It's pretty easy to harvest and handle if you're learning, you know, getting into entry butchering, uh, you know, a larger animal than a chicken, than a bird or a rabbit. Um, it's a good step in there. It's pretty easy to do. And yeah, you can, um, you know, you can preserve the lard. You can preserve a lot of those pieces, hang your own bacon, mm -hmm. hang your own prosciutto, which is really just Italian ham mm -hmm. that can store for a very, very long time. So that's that's a great entry win, and you don't need a ton of space. And the thing I like about pigs is they fit into the homestead system very well because they will consume a lot of the leftovers. You know, if you've got extra milk, um, if you're, you know, even if you're buying milk and you're making dairy products, you've got whey, you've got buttermilk, you can fatten the pigs on that. So it's very economical. You can fatten the pigs on all of the meat scraps. And the some of the heritage breeds and the lard breeds fatten easier, so they're a little more economical, where some of your fast-growing... Uh, meat breeds, um, you know, are going to take a little more grain. And, that, and that's fine. Pigs are fine. We're not trying to be all grass-fed with pigs. They're, they're not a ruminant. Um, but they do have some advantages in giving you more lard for the table, and they can be a little more economical to raise. Yeah, absolutely. A pig is also has the benefit that it's a lot easier to find a butcher to actually butcher your pigs for you. So if you're interested mm -hmm. in starting to raise animals, but you're not feeling like you are at the place where you're ready yeah. to butcher your own animals. A pig is really kind of that first step of something that you can call in a butcher, a custom butcher, and they'll take it and butcher it for you. Yeah. So. Now, how much meat are you gonna get? Um, there's a lot of variety in that based on the pigs. Yeah. And you know, we're raising lard pigs, and so we're getting a lot more lard and def definitely a little bit less meat in a smaller animal where you can get some very big, you know, a lot of people are targeting 250, 300 pounds for a feeder meat pig. And so, that's going to vary a lot, you know, from, I don't know, on ours, we haven't butchered the lard pigs yet, but I'm going to, I'm going to say 75 to hundred pounds of meat plus lard, um, maybe more, you know, all the way up to a couple hundred pounds of meat per yeah. pig. So that you'll just have to find out like, what do you have access to? Where are mm -hmm. you starting at? Talk to whoever's raising them, what you can expect for yield. And, um, but that's a good way to go. It's a good yeah. way to get started in a small space. They don't need a ton of space. If you get pigs and you raise them, get two. Don't just get one pig. Yeah. And this is, this is true with any animals, but don't get a single pig. So if you don't feel like you need that much meat, then get somebody to partner with you. Um, because they do, while they don't have to have a ton of space, they do need good clean space. Pigs actually aren't as dirty as everybody thinks. They, they like cooling off in the mud and water. Um, but they need good space and they need a buddy. They need a companion. Yeah, yeah. That, that's pretty true of most yeah. of the animals. Yep. Um, the next animal that we like and that we raise is kind of in this small animal category, and that is the sheep. Yep. Uh, we love our meat sheep. The meat is delicious. If you've had lamb before and you have the impression that you don't like lamb, try locally raised, well-raised mm -hmm. lamb, because it's probably different than the things that are coming over on the cargo ships from New Zealand or wherever they're coming from. Um, most people who come sit down at our table and eat lamb have the impression, oh, I don't really like lamb. And then they taste what we have. And they're like, Whoa. This is lamb? This is so good. I love this. It, it's absolutely delicious. It doesn't have to be strong in flavor. It can be really, really mild in flavor. Really can. And so sheep are pretty easy to work with. They're easy to handle. Again, they're another great entry if you're trying to learn to butcher and kind of go from raising all the way to get in your freezer yourself. Um, they're, they're, they're easy to work with in that way and manage. Now, you generally do need some pasture for sheep. Yes. Uh, you want a couple of them and, um, you know, you, 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 if you're gonna raise a couple of sheep, you need, depending on where you're at, and again, you, pasture changes everywhere, depending on where you're at in the country, but you can probably need at least a half acre or better to raise a couple of sheep. Um, and, um, I, I do want to say about sheep though, because right next to sheep is goats mm -hmm. and goats are very similar. Except sheep have this tendency to get into trouble in as many creative ways as they can. If there's a way to get stuck in something or to get in trouble with something, sheep will take that opportunity. On the other hand, goats have a tendency to try to get out of anything you put them in. Well, they want to go up is what it is with goats. They want and to go up. this is something I learned I didn't really realize. I learned filming with Anne of all trades. Uh -huh. and, and, and hearing Joel talk about it too in, in his book, goats are browsers. So, so they, they go are, they're up? going up. And so one of the reasons they get themselves in trouble is not so much because they're trying to escape, but they're looking up, they're climbing on things to find things because they're looking for food and they're naturally curious. 
And, so, and that's what gets them, makes them like, you know, all the stories that we hear about they don't They don't tend to get themselves in as much trouble. They just get out of everything that you put them into. Well, and then so they're, they're in trouble with me yeah. or you. Or, <laughs> then, or then they're in a different kind of trouble. So, so just in both of those, make sure you have really, really good fences and make sure it's free from things like little holes in the fence or, you know, anything that they could get in trouble. A couple, couple differences though. Sheep are grazers. <laughs> yes. And a lot of people get goats thinking that goats will do fine on pasture. Mm. And they can pasture, but goats are browsers. They, they, that's why they're up, they're looking up. So they really, if they don't have browse and you're feeding them on hay, which you can feed sheep and goats hay. Again, if you don't have pasture, if you have a small lot, you can feed them hay. But know that those goats are going to be up looking to things. They're looking for browse. And so that's why we don't have goats. Joel Saladin tells a hilarious story. If you guys know him, he's into all kinds of pastured animals. He tried goats and got up. And no matter what he did with the fences, I think they ended up on the car in the morning. <laughs> and and um, I'm sure I'm not retelling the story well. Because, um, but it was like, no, okay, they got to go. And I just totally relate. But you know what? Goats are great for some people because they can get meat, they can get milk, and it works real well. And, and, and that's fine. Just like sheep, goat's meat is wonderful. It's delicious. It, is. it yep. can be very mild. It can yep. be very good. It really can, so. as can the milk as well. Yes. Yeah. Good. So, okay, so th those are a lot of your smaller mm -hmm. animals. Next, we go to beef, right? Yeah. And we all, you know, generally as Americans, love our beef. Right. And that can be a little harder to tackle, though you can grass feed, you know, via hay, mm -hmm. a cow. You should really have a half acre and room to move around and a buddy, so a couple steers, a couple heifers or something. Now, I know a lot of people, and I don't mean to pick on goats too much, because they do but have their place. Picking. A lot of people think, do I get a goat or do I get a cow when it comes to well, beef to and milk, okay. right? Definitely dairy, yeah. And a lot of people think, well, the goat is going to be easier to handle. And that is not always the case. Mm -hmm. In fact, I really beg to differ on that. A cow is much easier um, or um, steer, oh, yeah. you know, is much easier to keep in a space. They will often stay very nicely in a space with a single line of electric wire. Um, and so just in thinking about these things, where you're going to start, d don't equate size to challenge level, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. You just, you want to know where your beef's coming from yeah. and, but beefs, while they're larger, they're definitely can be easier to keep in, easier to contain. Um, I like other breeds other than the Angus, the Angus, which is kind of the popular for the commercial market. They're generally one of the more high strung breeds. And so yeah. if you're going to buy a steer or two. Um, personally, I would stay away from Angus. They're not wrong. They just, they actually, we had one when we first moved up here and we were leasing some pasture and we had a black Angus steer in a mix of, you know, crossbreeds, whatever, that would jump the fence yes. all day long. He was like a goat. He just ping, ping her sheep right over it. Um, so anyways, just uh, just fi find an animal that's being raised, you know, the little mellow disposition, which is one of the reasons I like Herefords, because they're, they're pretty easy going and mellow. They really are. And but you got to blend that with what you have. And so, but you can do beef on a small holding, you know, if you've got a half acre, an acre, and even if it's not grass, I mean, grass is ideal. You just want to make sure they've got space to move around. You can keep it clean. You're not, it's not getting dirty and mucky and pooey. And they need buddies as well if you're going to go that route. But uh, again, a beef, you can yield three, four, 500 pounds of meat in a season and really take care of your meat needs. Mm, there you go. Yeah. Okay, another option for bringing in meat to your freezer or your house is hunting. Oh. And in some parts of the country, that is a very good option. And we're, and we're talking like sustenance hunting. And you know, as guys, yes, we all want to get the big buck. And, but if you're, you're in the city and you're in town and you don't have hunting close by and you're like, okay, I'm gonna go hunt, that's gonna be recreational, even if it's helping the house out, and you have to factor the cost in. And mm -hmm. so it does depend on where you're at that you can utilize and, that. And the flavor. Economically. You have to factor the flavor in because a lot of times that big buck does not taste nearly as good as something a little smaller and a little fresher. Yeah, absolutely. Younger <laughs> bucks and, and if you can hunt does, like we have, you know, we have doe season here. Mm -hmm. And a large doe is some of the best eating. And actually more obtainable. Bucks, you know, we're, you get kind of down the road and hunting a little bit, but, but bucks are sneakier, they're careful. That's how those big ones get big. Mm -hmm. And um, 
but yeah, hunting is a great way and, and venison is the most common and um, it's a good, good way. And that's what we use to supplement and, you know, also get out in the woods a little bit and practice some skills. And I know for me, it's a time of year where I get to just go sit and be quiet and enjoy nature because yeah. uh, the white tail hunting is what we do mostly. So yeah, that's a great way to go. That's good. Yep. Very good. Yep. And then, of course, we can always add in fishing right along with the hunting. That's a good way to bring in some meat. If you can't fish in your area, we already kind of talked about being mm -hmm. able to bring in fish from maybe a local provider of some sort who's actually going out and fishing and, uh, you know, handling the fish really well and getting it right to you. Yeah. So, so those are just all of these things you've got to work with the context that you're in, right, yeah. and where you live. And you're going to have more ability to do one or the other and different things. Right. And I think the really neat thing about all of these is getting to engage on the land, getting to engage in nature. And so mm -hmm. we're doing something that's productive, but that's rewarding that we can share with others. And, um, you know, raising, raising our own meat has been a joy to us for a lot of years, besides um, very, very good for the pocketbook. Yeah, and absolutely. And if you feel like you just are not in a place where you can start actually raising your own meat, or maybe you can only raise a little bit of it, make sure you look around mm -hmm. and see if you can find a local farmer, rancher that you can work directly with and buy in large amounts of meat, you know, maybe a, a half of a steer mm -hmm. or, you know, a whole hog or something like that all at the same time. So that one, you're helping develop your local economy. So we have locally raised meats again. That does in the long run help offset the costs going up and down. Um, but also it helps to get really healthy, good quality meat re-available to us at, on the local scale. And, and I'm glad you mentioned that because that's really, uh, we're not always going to be able to do everything ourselves and we shouldn't try to. And it, it really is important to support local smaller scale suppliers. That's what's going to help them increase and which ultimately is going to help give us resilience from when, you know, the, the big factories fail like we saw during COVID and cause the meat problems, the more people that we have and the more you're <laughs> supporting uh, these farmers around you. Yeah. And if you can do that instead of the farmer's market, you're going to get a better price by buying it in a half or a whole. And even some of them would probably work with you if you want to save even a little more if you're going that route in, you know, delivering it on the hoof so you can butcher it yourself. That's just some things to think about. And then you save that cost as well, even if you've got to go buy the animal. So it's different ways to approach it um, to help you get that year's worth of meat, you know, into the freezer or into the canning jars or even hanging in the pantry. Mm -hmm. And um, one way or another, thing. make sure you start taking steps to come together, come, come up with your meat plan because it's not going to get any cheaper at the grocery store. And honestly, the quality is not going up. If you want good, healthy meat, you got to come up with a plan on how you're going to yeah. provide it. And, you know, divorcing the grocery store a little bit, that's a good thing right now. I'm, and, and I'm if all you, for it. And if you can't get to a year's worth, just figure out how much a year's worth is and figure out what can I do this year. Yeah. Can I raise a batch of 50 chickens? Yeah. Or can I do some rabbits or, you know, a couple sheep? Just, just figure out what you can do and work for you and you start moving that direction. Absolutely. Hey, you guys, don't forget to grab your subscription to the In the Homestead Kitchen magazine. I will put the link in the description for you guys, but grab it now while you can. Been good hanging with you all. We'll see you soon. <laughs> okay. Bye. Goodbye.